Hey guys, I'm going to do, here let me show you my face. I'm going to do a really, really short teaching or reading from scripture. Not much of a teaching. This passage really speaks for itself, but I'm going to highlight one phrase. Now my son is asleep on my lap. I'm going to show you the scripture. Let's go back. We're going to read from Luke 12, and we're going to talk about the parable of the faithful steward. Um, Luke 12, starting at verse 42, the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward of the estate, whom his master will put in charge over his household, to give his servants their portion of food at the proper time? Okay, so stop right here. This person is a spiritual leader. This is a person in authority over others, like a pastoral role. They're given, or maybe a teaching role, but definitely a pastoral role, some um, higher level of authority because they have people underneath them that they're in charge of feeding with spiritual food and giving them the right portion of food at the proper time. So discerning the times and knowing what to feed at the right time, okay? Verse 43, blessed, which means happy, prosperous, and to be admired, is that servant whom his master finds doing so when he arrives. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. Look at verse 45. This is an if situation, meaning if the faithful servant does a different thing. So this is the same servant. But this is a different scenario. So it's the same servant, but if he goes bad, if he chooses otherwise, if he behaves differently. See, look at the language. Verse 45, but if that servant, okay, it's the same servant. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is taking his time in coming and begins to beat the servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. Okay, so first we notice that it's talking about the same servant. And he is um, thinking that the Lord is delaying in coming. That's huge, because as we get to the end of the age, people get more and more complacent, and they get tired of waiting, and they're tired of talking about the Lord's return, and they reject the messages of the watchmen, because nobody wants to be watching for the Lord's return. So if that same servant says in his heart, my master is taking a long time coming, and then he, when he compromises and he goes lukewarm, he begins to beat the servants. He's beating on the true Christians, the remnant, those who are walking in holiness and preaching holiness. They're fighting against them because that's what lukewarm Christians always do. When they backslide, then they hate on those who are preaching and teaching holiness. They really hate us. Anytime you see a Christian backslide and go lukewarm, they're going to fight the message of truth and they're going to fight the truth tellers and they're going to fight the remnant of believers that are standing strong. I know it because it happens to me all the time. I'm literally hated by the lukewarm. They hate the message that we give. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces. This is a huge phrase right here, guys. We're on Luke 12, verse 46. Cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. I slowed down on that phrase and I underlined it because this phrase right here distinguishes this wicked servant, distinguishes him from an unbeliever. He is not an unsaved person. He was with the Lord. He worked for the Lord. He backslid and he goes to the same place that the unbelievers go. It says, with the unbelievers, he is a backslider. I don't want anyone to tell me there's no such thing as backsliding or that once saved, always saved. Because that is unscriptural. When you backslide, when you go back to the ways of the world, you are going to be sent to be tortured and punished with the unbelievers. There it is. Check your Bibles. It'll say that. Luke 12. 46. Let's keep reading. And that servant who knew his master's will, yet did not get ready or act in accord with his will, will be beaten with many lashes. Wow.
That's powerful stuff, guys. If you backslide and you go lukewarm, you're going to be punished with the unbelievers. That's distinguishing you from the unbelievers. This was not a faker. Okay? Everyone who believes in once saved, always saved says, well, if they fell away, then they were never the Lord's to begin with. That's not biblical, and that's not what the Bible says. This guy was a believer. He was a servant of the Most High. He went bad. He was not feeding his flock with the truth in due season, discerning the times, preparing them for the catching away. Then he went lukewarm, started beating the servants, because lukewarm backsliders always fight those who teach and preach holiness. That's what they do. And they are punished with the unbelievers. They are distinguished as separate from the unbelievers, but they're given the same punishment because they're not an unbeliever. They are a backsliding Christian. They fell back into the world. Okay? You know, the Bible is just full of warnings against falling away. People that say you can't fall away from the Lord, they're just not, not reading their Bibles. They're deceived. It's, it's not impossible to fall away. Otherwise, Jesus was wasting his time, wasting his breath, warning against falling away and being cut off and burned, like the branches that are cut off and burned. Look, look at this. I just, all I did was flip my Bible backwards. You can find it on almost every single page. Now I'm um, on Luke 10. Um, and a certain lawyer... An expert in Mosaic law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this is a question of what do I do to be saved and, and, and get eternal life. Jesus said to him, what is, it written, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And so the guy replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this habitually and you will live. Nope, he didn't say, do it one time. He didn't say, just start out with me and you'll be sealed and, and that means you can never lose your salvation and you're just going to be saved on the last day. Nope. You have to do it habitually. Why would Jesus command us to be habitually in right relationship with God? To serve God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind habitually. Because you have to keep doing it. Some people, they take this promise in Ephesians about being sealed. They don't look at the language. They take one scripture and they lie. And they say, oh, because it says we're sealed, we cannot fall away. That's not what scripture says. Jesus gave us the parable of the wicked servant who was once with the Lord, serving the Lord, and then fell away and was punished and sent to be tortured with the unbelievers because it is possible to, to fall away, especially as we're in the final moments of the end of time. So that's just one warning, but I mean, I could go to any book in the Bible. I'm not like, I'm going off script here. I don't really have this plan, but I'm just going to read this because I already know what's in it. Let's just, all you have to do is read John chapter 15. Okay. I am the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Okay? So each branch that's in him, in Jesus, if you're not bearing fruit, but you started out in Jesus, you're going to be taken away. And every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes. Are you feeling pruned? Are you feeling disciplined? That's because Christ loves you and you're in him. And he's refining you and perfecting you through fiery trials. So that you can bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have given you. Remember, it's the washing of the word that sanctifies us. The word sanctifies us. Jesus says that. The word says that. Remain in me and I will remain in you. This is a conditional, guys. I even wrote that on my Bible. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself. Without remaining in the vine, neither can you bear fruit, producing evidence of your faith, unless you remain in me. Now, listen up. In order to remain in Jesus, you have to be in him to begin with. So Jesus is commanding us to stay in him. Remain in him. You call Jesus a liar if you say that you can't walk away from him. Because he's commanding us to remain in him. Why would he command us this if it's possible, if it's not possible to walk away?
Continue reading. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who remains in me, and I in him. There is much fruit, for otherwise, apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch, and withers and dies, and they gather the branches, and they throw them in the fire. That's hell, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified and honored by this, when you bear much fruit, and prove yourselves to be my true disciples. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Jesus like tells us this over and over again. He's commanding us to remain in him. This is active remaining. We have to choose to stay in him daily. Just like Paul wrote, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul wrote, I fear that, you know, after doing all this work for the Lord, that I myself would be disqualified. We have to check ourselves. Paul said, check yourself to see if you're even in the faith. It's not bad to check ourselves continually. Look at verse 10. If, there's a conditional if, you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, you will remain in my love. Hyper grace Christians hate this. They have to do everything they can to dissect the scripture. There are even some that go so far as to saying that what Jesus taught does not apply to believers. Did you hear what I just said? They say, we believe Paul's gospel, not Jesus' gospel. Jesus was talking to Jewish Christians. He's teaching kingdom gospel. Do you hear what I'm saying? They come up with heresies because the teachings of Jesus are hard to accept. That's baloney. Jesus is talking to Christians, those who are in Christ, those who are part of the new covenant, the blood covenant. If you are a follower of Christ, you follow his teachings. It is one gospel. There is one gospel in scripture, not two. This is why they reject Christ's teachings, because they're hard. Because they're difficult. If you keep my, te my commandments and obey my teaching, if you're doing this, if you continue to keep his commandments, you will remain in his love. You don't remain in Christ's love when you're living in sin. You don't remain in his love when you, when you, when you go back to the world and pick up a habitual sin again. When you walk away from the straight and very narrow path which few find, Jesus said. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. You want to remain in His love? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Walk in obedience. Crucify the flesh. Walk on that straight and narrow. People are going to be surprised when the rapture happens. People are going to be surprised who gets left behind. Because they are lying to themselves by not studying the full counsel of Scripture and, and believing heresies and teaching and believing in hyper grace where they think that uh, Jesus loves them no matter what. Well, he does love you, but you need to be holy. And they've deceived themselves. And I've heard everything. And I've heard when God looks at you, he just sees the cross. He doesn't see your sin. Oh, really? Not if you're living in unrepented sin. Because I'm telling you, what Jesus said to John in Revelation when Jesus was in his glorified, resurrected body. And he told John to write these letters to the churches, which are Christians. Churches that have lampstands, which means the Holy Spirit is there. They're Christians. They're saved. And he pointed out specific sins that each church was engaged in. And if you don't repent, I will snuff out the lampstand. I will leave you. I will take the Holy Spirit. I will come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. I, you will be my enemy. I will fight against you if you do not repent. And he told them exactly what sins each church needed to repent of. So you can't say Jesus doesn't see your sin. He sees your sin. He sees your sin. But these, these hyper grace deceptions are just everywhere now. They're ubiquitous in the church and they're not biblical. If you're living in a sin without turning away from it, Christian, you need to turn away from it because he's coming for a pure bride. Don't believe me? Read Ephesians chapter 5. She is sanctified by the washing of the word. You have to turn away from your sins. He sees your sins. God is not mocked. He's not covering his eyes. Oh, I can't see that Christian that's looking at pornography because of Christ's blood. Nope. Read the Bible. He sees Christian sin. If it's not repented of it, he sees it. 
Okay, and that's not the only sin. Fornication, cursing, outbursts of anger, all kinds of sin. You're lying to yourself if you say, he doesn't see my sin. If you're living in ongoing, unrepented sin, he sees it. For the book of 1 John says, those who sin belong to the devil, those who practice righteousness belong to Jesus. Okay, I just read in, in um, one of the Gospels the other day, I can't remember exactly what it was, but Jesus said, um, okay, so you... You give to your friends. He's talking to his disciples. Okay, you give to your friends. So what? Even the sinners do. Okay. You need to give to your enemies. You need to love your enemies. You need to pray for your enemies. But the thing is, I said, whoa, this is cool because Jesus is again distinguishing between his hearers, which were his disciples, and sinners. So again, Jesus is saying... Oh, well, you, you give to your friends, you're cool with your friends, even the sinners do that. So Jesus is saying, but you guys are not sinners. This is what I expect from you. So again, he's showing that his disciples are not sinners. You're not, there's no such thing as a drunken Christian or a drinking Christian or a smoking weed Christian. If you're a Christian, you practice righteousness at all times. Practice holiness. That's what it says in the Bible. So I'm just tired of just telling you guys, I've heard everything I've heard every twisting of the gospel so that um, these Christians can feel good in their sin and they want to be one foot in the world and, and one foot going to church on Sunday and they want to get emotional in worship and claim the love of Jesus but they haven't repented. They haven't broken up with their sin yet. It's not true. It's not true that you can live in sin and be, belong to Christ. You have to break up with your sin. It's one or the other. And the rapture is going to really surprise people. Why do they say, why did Jesus say I'm coming like a thief in the night? What is he stealing, you guys? What is he stealing? I'll tell you the answer. He's stealing the wise virgins. He's breaking into the house, which is the church, and he's only taking a couple. He's only taking the bride of Christ, those who have been watching and waiting for him and making themselves ready. He's a thief. He's going to break apart churches, and the vast majority are going to be left behind. That's why he's a thief in the night, because you don't know what time he's coming, and he's only going to take a few. He's not taking the whole church. He's taking the church of Philadelphia. He's taking the five wise virgins. Being a Christian does not mean you're going to get taken in the rapture, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of hard news, but that's what scripture says. So, be ready guys. We're going to see Jesus any day now. Just want to bring the word, and stay in the fear of the Lord, and stay watching Jesus, because any day now we're going to be translated and then all hell breaks loose on the world jesus said it's sudden destruction sudden destruction those seals that break from the beginning which basically has not happened yet because the the blowing of the trumpet hasn't happened yet we haven't been translated up there but when that happens peace is taken from the earth and bloodshed is everywhere it's world war three it's nukes it's the ezekiel 38 war on israel it's war in the street it's people killing each other just for sport just for the love of it Peace is taken from the earth and people are going to be wicked everywhere and it's game on. Okay, I wouldn't want to be left behind for anything. But you guys preach this message. Preach to your Christian friends because hopefully we can get more foolish virgins ready before that trumpet call. Because that's where my heart is. My heart is to the church. To wake up the church. The rapture harvest is being stolen from by Satan because of all these false teachings and lukewarmness and backsliding. And they're not ready to be the bride. They're going to get left behind with the unbelievers. Just like the wicked servant. He was left behind with the unbelievers. He's not an unbeliever. He's a backslidden Christian. God bless you guys.